So he's born into this family of ilm, the Fahfu family. His father was one of the direct students. Uh, Fahfu was one of the direct students of Mukhtar Wildbuna, one of the greatest luminaries of the ulama of Mauritania. And he taught generations of ulama. Many of the asanid of ilm within Mauritania, especially in Taganit, go back to Mukhtar Wildbuna. Um, so he was, uh, he was born into that family. He was known very young for, his, for being a salih, for being a, a righteous man. And soon after he completed his studies, he went to Hajj at a very young age. Um, there's another video online where I, I talk more about his story. So if you want to go into his story uh, more, that, that video is available. Maybe Saleh, you could put the link in there as well. It was one recorded at Seekers uh, in Canada. I'm no longer uh, part of that organization, but uh, that video is still there. So <clears throat> his, his entire trip took three years. He began walking. Uh, and he walked all across the Saharan Desert. He spent about eight months in Sudan, uh, and he was actually teaching, and the people actually asked him to stay there. And there's a lot of similarities between the Sudanese and the Mauritanian culture, a lot of things. There, and, 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 and basically, and I've pointed this out to some Sudanese, and they're like, oh yeah, you're right. They're both Arab cultures, desert Bedouin Malikis. And so you get, you get more similarities between Sudanese and Mauritanians than Moroccans and Mauritanians or Senegalese and Mauritanians, even though they're on separate sides of the continent. In any case, um, so, <clears throat> so he went to Hajj. <clears throat> <clears throat> he made the entire Hajj. On the way there, he wrote a poem, a very fam famous poem of his shawq, of his desire to see the Haramain. And on the way back, he wrote another poem uh, uh, about his sadness for, for, for leaving. But he had been given uh, opportunities to settle and remind you this is about the 1930s so while the the Saudi kingdom is beginning to get established so those families who were there at the time even if they were not originally Saudi and Saleh knows this um, they would they right now he, he and his children would have been Saudi citizens you know they would have been accepted in so he got uh, uh, invitations to stay and teach but he said I cannot fulfill the rights of being a, a neighbor of the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam so i have to i'm going back and you'll see this quite often in some of the books of the salihin some people their hal their stay said i can't fulfill the, the the obligations of being a neighbor to the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam other people said i have my hal is that i love him so much i want to be next to him and be buried in the baqia and that's actually one of murabat al hajj students uh, who i met left Mauritania to go to Medina, he said, my only goal in life now is to be buried in the Baqir next to the Prophet ﷺ, near the Prophet, of course. He came back to Taganit, <clears throat> and one of the things that he found was that his uncle, so if you know uh, in the UK, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Haddamin has visited the UK a few times. His father is Sheikh Muhammad Al-Amin, also known as Haddamin. His father is Abdurrahman, Sheikh Abdurrahman. Um, this is different than Sheikh Abdul Rahman, the son of Murabat al Hajj, who's in Spain. But Sheikh Abdul Rahman had spent some time in Western Mauritania and had taken on the Qadri Tariqa uh, and then came back to Taganit. When Murabat al Hajj came back, now mind you, he's a young man coming in. This is an elder, a respected elder, a alim, uh, a teacher within the school. But Murabat al Hajj convinced him, he said, um, you know, to his uncle in a respectful way, please give up this Tariqa. Give, you know, don't, don't take on the tariqa. And he convinced um, uh, Abdul Rahman to give up the tariqa. If he had not, it could have affected the rest of that, that section of the tribe, and the tariqa could have been brought in as a cultural tradition. I'm going to talk a little bit more about why, why was it, that's the question, that Murabat al-Hajj was against the tariqa. And in one, uh, and again, this is oral history, but what I've heard from some of the people is that he actually took the subha, the prayer beads of Abdul Rahman, and he broke them. So he convinced him to leave the tariqa and he actually broke the, the subha. And the significance of that is um, other than being kind of symbolic, but each tariqa sometimes um, uh, would have a specific word. And so they would tie subhas, prayer beads, into the specific format of what they read. And so, so when you see somebody subha, if it's not just a regular, you know, 33, 33, 33, and then the, the, then the last one, it'll actually be broken up per the width of that specific tariqa or, or, or sub tariqa. So he broke that. He lived in Taganit. He began his school. He only had a few students. There was another larger school uh, in another area by Murabat uh, Sadfi Wildeya Mustafa, who was one of the foremost authorities in the Qira'at al-Ashar, in addition to his fiqh and aqidah and all of the other ulum. And Murabat al-Hajj would go there and, and pray at his mahdara. 
even as a young man, imagine a senior alim and now a young junior alim, Murabat al Hajj is coming in, who ilm wise, this senior alim is still uh, uh, higher than him. And I'll mention a story about that. He, whenever Murabat al Hajj would visit his mahdara, he would tell everybody, let Murabat lead the, lead the jama'ah. Like he would step back as the regular imam and let Murabat al Hajj lead the prayer. And he would do this because of the, the righteousness that he saw in Murabat al-Hajj. At another time, there was a mas'ala that had come to some of the mahdaras, the mahdara being the name of like madrasa or uh, centers of learning. So uh, there was a mas'ala, a matter of bay' that, um, that was mentioned. <clears throat> Murabat al-Hajj responded to it. Then that fatwa, because they do peer review, they call it taqrir, they'll have multiple people review the fatwa. Um, taken to Murabat Mustafa, Sadfi Waldeya, and he looked at the fatwa and he said, this is a very complicated matter of, of transaction, of bay'ah. Only, you know, it takes a lot of like uh, senior scholarship to really unravel this one. So Murabat al-Hajj, he said in this situation, got the mas'ala wrong, but then he took the fatwa and he went like this on his face with it. He did tabarruk. He sought, the, he sought the blessings. And that's something that's not rejected by Murabat al-Hajj and his, and, his, and his students and those in the, in the, even the fuqaha in that area, seeking blessings from physical objects. Um, and Sheikh Sayyid Ali al Malik, he talks a lot about this in the notions that must be corrected um, and, and uh, to refute the people who reject the concept of tabarruk. But Murabat Mustafa al saw that Murabat al-Hajj even as a alim and as a, as a, as a, as a accomplished alim, what he shone for was his righteousness, was his salah. When Murabat Mustafa uh, Sadfi Wal Dayya um, passed away, all of his students came to the Mahdara of Murabat al-Hajj, which is about maybe half a day or a day's walk. <clears throat> Murabat al-Hajj asked, he said, why are the students coming to me now? They said, oh, Murabat Mustafa Wal Dayya passed away, and so now we're going to come to your Mahdara. And so Murabat al-Hajj mentioned some lines of poetry, basically that when the green grass is all eaten up, the cows have to pasture on the, on the dry, dead grass. He was talking about himself. The Hashim is the broken up, dead grass. So he was saying that out of his humility. So what is Murabat al-Hajj known for? He's known, of course, for his salah, for his righteousness, um, I mentioned the story of uh, Murabat Sadfi and the tabarruk that he did of his fatwa. He's known for his wara'. Wara' is leaving, leaving things for fear of falling into them. So we, we stay out of doubtful matters um, for fear of falling into something. That's called wara'. So it might not be wajib, or maybe it is wajib, or maybe there's another opinion, but I'm going to take the safest opinion. So he's always taking the safest opinion um, to be on, 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 the, on, on the very safe side. And I'll mention a, a story about that. Uh, <clears throat> older times in Mauritania, the sugar was not powdered. It came in these cones. In Morocco, they had a production, even before the sugar cane that came out of West Indies or, or Egypt, um, or began in West Indies and was imported to Egypt. Um, <clears throat> or they had it, but not as much as like in the, in the West. Uh, but they had sugar beets. And so they would make these cones of sugar. Murabat Haddamin, loaned a, uh, a sugar cone to Murabat al-Hajj. And when Murabat al-Hajj later on came, he used that one, got another one, was going to repay it. Uh, Murabat Muhammad al-Amin, he, he told him, he said, just, uh, just to mention something, the, the cone that I had given you, a little piece was chipped off. And so Murabat said, take off the same amount, take off the same amount. What he was afraid of is when you loan somebody something, if you give them back more, that's riba. And according to the Maliki scholars, that even if it's done outside of the aqid, it's not allowed. So if he gave him a cone of sugar, but it was chipped, he has to replace it with a cone of sugar that was chipped. That's a cone of sugar, a small cone of sugar. But that's just one example of the many examples of his wara. There's another famous scholar, <clears throat> uh, Muhammad Salim al adud who when he met one of the, uh, the students of Murabat al-Hajj, he said, I want to let you know, al-ilmu fi Mauritania kathir. There's a lot of knowledge in Mauritania. وَالْوَرَعُ فِي شَخْصٍ وَاحِدٍ Wara is in one person, meaning Murabat al-Hajj. He's known for zuhud. He doesn't care about the dunya. Money comes in as gifts, goes out the other hand, literally. People would come and he's giving out. And that shows you that he does not have the attachment to the, dun the dunya. Um, he won't get involved in land disputes. So even though there's, uh, there, there's a, he has the ability 
to help people out with land disputes. He's like, go take, there's other fuqaha who can deal it. I don't want to deal with land disputes. Uh, even when his own tribe is involved. And I was there one time when there was a land dispute, when they brought the letter to him and they said, you know, to Murabat al-Hajj, when they got to the, the point where it said, Ard -niza uh, niza, uh, ardiyya, uh, land dispute, he said, no, 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 go take it to another faqih. I'm not, I'm not going to get involved in this. Um, <clears throat> whenever his village would move, he wouldn't get involved in the process. He, he, he gave, he gave the, the choice of moving his, his village to his wife and to his cousin, Murabat Haddamin. He's like, you guys decide, and I, you know, I'm, 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 I don't need to be involved. One time he was walking out the cows in the morning. And uh, so in the morning, the, the cows, because they're, 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 they're pastoral society, um, they, would, they would have the cows. You put the cows in one direction and the calves in another direction. Otherwise, the calves would drink all the milk. So you have to walk the cows out of the village one way, hold the calves in. Then once they're gone, the moms and are gone, then you take the calves and walk them out the other way. He was walking out his cows one time and he told people, uh, he, he walked them out to a certain point. He said, this is enough of tasebub. I'm going back to the village. What tasebub is, is that when we say depending on Allah and giving up the dunya, we still have to do something. It's not end up just to sit around and just wait for Allah to, you know, if I want to get, if I want to drink water, I can't just say, oh, I'm depending on Allah. No, pick up the cup and drink the water. Do something. Uh, but <clears throat> but it's edna tasebub. You know, are you going to, um, like the hadith says, depend on Allah and tie the camel. But the tying of the camel is just, uh, could the camel still get away? Maybe. We're not going to tie down the camel and hamstring the camel and do aqaruha and, and do ta'qir of the camel and cut its legs off and tie it down with chains. We're going to do the basics. So the level of our attachment to the dunya will will uh, will Im, uh, indicate how or, or will, will 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 influence how much to sebub, how much we do to get the dunya and murabat al hajj says i'm just going to walk the cows out they're going to go their way the other cows are now i'm going back to my ibadah and my teaching he was known for hadith during his trip to 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 uh uh, <clears throat> uh to to mecca he, he studied hadith on the way back he actually wanted to get ijazah from um uh from um uh, Sheikh Habibullah with Mayaba, who left Mauritania during the, the French occupation, made hijrah, said it's no longer uh, permissible to stay in a land occupied by the kuffar, by the non-Muslims. So he made hijrah. He ended up in Azhar, became a hadith teacher there. He's actually, uh, Sheikh Muhammad Habibullah uh, with Mayaba is one of the direct teachers of Sheikh Saleh al-Ja'fari, if you're familiar with him. An amazing alim with an amazing story. Um, and uh, he has a lot of qasaid about the, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he used to make his public le lectures. He said three things. You don't need to teach fiqh and, and, and theology in public. He said, call people to three things. Um, Quran, love of the Prophet, and love of his Ahlul Bayt. And if you look at the hadith, there's a hadith that mentions these things. أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَلَى ثَلَاثِ خِصَالِ حُبِّ نَبِيِّكُمْ وَحُبِّ آلِ بَيْتِهِ وَقِرَاءَةِ الْقُرْآنِ <clears throat> those three things <clears throat> on the way back he wanted to get ijazah in the sahih sitta um sahih sitta from from with mayaba uh, but he could not go in because he didn't have passport so he made his entire journey with no legal documentation no paperwork he's known for dhikr always reciting quran always re doing dhikr teaching honoring his guests reciting quran all the time many times i would come to sit in my lesson with him he's reciting quran he sees a student he stops he says, do you have a lesson? Yes. He'll, 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 he'll do the lesson, very short and concise. He'll say anything else? No. And he'll pick up. And he's doing khatams all the time. Even towards his last days where he could not even sit up or eat himself, they said, I asked his grandson who was his uh, uh, round, the, round the clock caretaker, I said, how many times is he doing khatams? He says, I don't hear the entire qira'a, but I hear him doing a dua of khatam every single night. This is even when he's over 100 years old, some say 110 or 115, and he's literally bedridden and just not able to do anything. He's doing a khatam a day. He's reciting, if I came, if you walk by his house at 1, 2 a.m., you would hear him reading the Quran. If you came, if you walk by at 3 or 4 a.m., you know, I don't think he ever fully went into sleep. And I've slept in his tent when I first went there in 98. I don't think he fully went into sleep because you always hear the hum of Quranic recitation coming from him, uh, rahimullah. He's known for teaching students and giving his time to teaching his students. Salatul Tasbih, if you know this salah, it's four rak'ahs. Um, in the Maliki school, 
the nawafil are two rak'ahs. The only, and it's actually haram to do, according to the Maliki school, to do more than two. The only exception they do is for Salat al-Tasbih, which is four rak'ah. According to the Hadith, Salat al-Tasbih, if you do it one time in your life, you, all of your sins are forgiven. Murabat al-Hajj would do it every single day before Dhuhr. His four rak'ahs before Dhuhr was Salat al-Tasbih. And the, the, the men who were around him, he, they told me, he said, Murabat al-Hajj does it every single day. Why would a person do it every single day unless they really were seeking the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Even when they're not, people around him who, who, who were around him for 60, 70 years, a number of his family members, they, were, they maintained his suhbah for 60 or 70 years. They said, we, we were here as kids, and now they're old men. They stay. They said, we have never seen him do a haram. We've never seen him do something that's makru. We've never seen it. We've never seen him do it. And that man is doing Salat al-Tasbih every day. What does it tell you about his hal? So even if he doesn't have a tariqah or he doesn't have a wird, you know, you, we are hearing these things. And to me, one of the things that I gained from my father and my mother, I don't really care about titles. I, and, 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 and that's what the, you know, we should, that's part of our deen. We don't look at titles. Somebody could come with Mufti Sheikh, Allama, Peer, you know, uh, uh, Mola, whatever title it is. We're going to look at the substance of what that person is and who they are. Uh, he's known for, for never leaving the mashhur of his madhab, even within the mashhur, always going with the safest uh, opinion. No ghibah. Uh, one time a student uh, started saying something about somebody else's horse in his prisons. He said, I fled the dunya to get away from ghibah. Don't bring ghibah into my majlis. Um, he has a number of stories, and I know we're running short on time. Connection to the ghib. We can go into the stories of, of, of the ghib and the karamat. Um, that he has, but I will say one thing, that there was not a focus on these stories that, that showed his connection to the, the ghayb, especially by his family. In fact, his family were very, um, were very sensitive if people mentioned the karamat, uh, the, the miracles that people had experienced with Murabat al-Hajj, because they didn't want, they didn't want you know, uh, everything to become like that. And I asked Muhammad Zain, who's one of the students of Murabat al-Hajj, and a Sharif, Idrisi Sharif, uh, who, is one of the, they, they said they've only seen Murabat al-Hajj stand up for two people. And I still haven't figured out who the second person is, but one of them is Muhammad Zain, who's his student, but he's a Sharif. And he used to tell people, he said, the ulama have said about the Sharif that there's a khilaf, whether the Sharif who is a fasiq is better than the non-Sharif who is a alim. Who's better in fadl? And they said, so, فَمَا بَالُكَ بِالشَّرِيفِ الْعَالِمِ الصَّالِحِ And so, uh, you know, what do you think about a Sharif who's a alim and righteous? So here's, here's Muhammad Zain. Whenever he would come to the Mahbara, Murabat al-Hajj would get up and go out, to, uh, go out to greet him. And there's a story that they had uh, that Muhammad Zain related to me where he saw somebody from the past that was one of the Salihin from the past. And Murabat al-Hajj asked him, he said, do you know who this is? He said, no. He said, this is the ghoth of his time. And then he went into a story of that. So there are these stories of the, them having connection to the ghayb, but his family, they don't like people talking about that. And I asked Muhammad Zain, I said, how come people don't talk about the karamats and how come there's not that many more karamats of people like Murabat al-Hajj? He said, Rami, you have to remember, Murabat al-Hajj and men like him are murabitin ala sharia. They're guardians on the fortress of sharia. And so they have to present this outward uh, uh, connection and this and giving the importance to the outward, because if they if they if they if they focus all of their time on the inward, people are going to come in. They're like, oh, I'm going to bypass all of that outward knowledge and go straight to the inward knowledge. With with noticing though that that Murabat al Hajj did not like people saying that there's an outward Sharia and an inward Sharia, and you may have heard these terms, that oh, the fuqaha they're concerned with the outward Sharia, and the the, the, the Ahlul Ma'rifah, they're concerned with the inward Sharia. He didn't like that. He said the Sharia is one. Um, and I'll mention something about uh, Al Junaid uh, about this. Uh, but when I, going back to that original dhikr that I had taken, uh, that I had, was present in, I remember the person who was leading it, he kept referring to faqees like these faqees, these faqees, like in a very condescending tone. And you have to be careful of that. If you find anybody, uh, referring to fiqh or fuqaha in a condescending tone, that's a huge red flag. Be careful. Even if they say they're the biggest peer, uh, salih, wali, uh, uh, you know, presenter of tasawwuf, of proper tasawwuf, be careful of that. We know Imam al-Shafi'i said, If the fuqaha who are practicing their deen are not walis, Allah does not have any walis. Murabat al-Hajj also has no connection to the government. He respects the government. 
And if the government gives an order, he tells people that's the order of the government. But he doesn't go to the Sultan. He's not, he's not knocking on the door of the Sultan. In fact, one time the president, um, uh, uh, or this was with an, another student, but he would never make, go out, of, he would never uh, go to, uh, to, to the government, um, uh, to the presence of the, of the, the gover governments, unless they had requested his presence. And the only story that I know of that is one time where before the current presidency, there was a regional um, Sheikh of the Qaba'il, who was recognized as the leader at that time, he requested Murabat al-Hajj's presence, and he says, Amruka Muta. Actually, no, sorry. The story is Murabat al-Hajj had moved from Taganit down to Geru, and uh, the, wali of uh, the, the Wali of Taganit said, he's requesting you to come uh, to, 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 to come to his presence. And he says, Amruka Muta. I will obey the ruler. If the ruler gives me an order, I will obey him. But he's not, he, he would actually encourage his students, do not take jobs with the government. Uh, and he actually cut off one of his family members who had taken a job with the government. So he's, he, he's, he respects the government, but he's not in, included in, in, in the government. Um, and this is important for us to know because there has been a ploy by, both by Muslim governments and by Western powers to use tasawwuf and tariqah as a way to control the masses and follow whatever authoritarian dictatorships uh, they, want to, they want to place up. So he has a lot of ulama and qadis and salihin at his time. Not many books, but he did create men. And I learned this term from Salih yesterday, tasniful rijal. He authored men. Um, and the, the people who came out as, uh, of his hands uh, are known for ilm, knowledge, taqwa, zuhud, against bid'ah, very traditional, and very independent thinking to the point that some of his main students will dis disagree with him um, in, in fatwa. I've seen one of his main students disagree with him on a number of times about the entrance of Maghrib time and Murabat al-Hajj says, I'm gonna pray in Maghrib. And his main student says, I'm gonna pray at my house. And it does not cause a fitna. Now think of any tariqah with any sheikh. If the sheikh said, I'm gonna pray Maghrib or I'm gonna pray Isha because I'm, I, I'm looking at the sky and I believe it's in. So for me, it's sound. He, the other person's like, I'm not, I learned from you. I learned that I cannot pray until I have yaqeen of the entrance of the time of prayer. I'm gonna go pray my jama'ah over there. And I've actually prayed sometimes with the Jama'ah of Murabat al-Hajj in, in those rare instances, sometimes like, no, I think it's in too. I'm going to pray with Murabat al-Hajj. Or no, I'm having doubt too. I'm going to pray with Murabat al -Hadamin. You're not going to find that in a lot of tariqahs. Independent thinking is removed from a lot of the tariqah structures of we just do taslim to the sheikh and we have to be like the al-mayyat bayna yaday al-ghasil, like the, the dead person being washed and all of these other terms. So look for any time if in a tariqah somebody negates or inhibits independent thinking that's within the lines of the sharia that's another red flag so again tariqa or not tariqa we're kind of at the end um i'll end with this the first introduction to tariqa or to sawwuf sorry with with murabat al-hajj is the traditional text that's studied in west and north africa uh, Ibn Ashir, the Tasawwuf of Ibn Ashir, and it's available. Um, and I've been invited by uh, Saleh and Dar al-Hadith to to do a series on the the Tasawwuf section of Ibn Ashir, and we're working out the details of that. So that's something we can look forward to. But that's how he begins by presenting Tasawwuf to to the students. It's a very clear. It's not esoteric su Sufism. It's not philosophical. It's very clear. This is how you practice Ihsan. Um, at the beginning of Ibn Ashir, it says. Uh, this book is in the aqidah of Imam al-Ash'ari. So we're Ash'aris. We're not Atharis. We're not anything else. If you want to be on this path, you're Ash'ari. You're Maliki. You're Junaidi. And that's what Murabat al-Hajj is. If somebody asks you who he is, he's Ash'ari, he's Maliki, he's Junaidi in his Tasawwuf. Tasawwuf in the path of Junaid. What Junaid said, this path of ours is the Quran and Sunnah. So anything you hear from people who present it as being from the path of Tasawf, weigh it on the scales of the Sharia. The only way to do that is to be able to, ha to be grounded in the scales of the Sharia. When I got to the section in the Tasawf of Ibn Ashir where it says, يَصْحَبُ شَيْخًا عَارِفَ الْمَسَالِكِ يَقِيهِ فِي طَرِيقِهِ الْمَحَالِكِ يُذَكِّرُهُ اللَّهَ إِذَا رَآهُ وَيُوصِلُ الْعَبْدَ إِلَى مَوْلَاهُ Parts of Tasawf is befriending a shaykh that will lead him to Allah, that will remind him of Allah when he sees him and will take the salik, the person who's traveling, to his Lord. That's the, 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 the shaykh. Those are the characteristics of the shaykh. And there's more books. Zarruq talks more about it. Uh, what are the characteristics of the shaykh? What happens when you don't have a complete shaykh and so forth? I asked Murabat al-Hajj. I said, where can we find this shaykh? Murabat al-Hajj, this man that we've been talking about, said, I have searched for him and I have not found him. 
So this person who can lead with bay'ah, allegiance, I will, I will follow you, you know, I'll file, follow your every word, trusting you. Murabat al-Hajj is telling me, I have not found a man of this caliber, and, uh, and he has not followed. So what does that tell me? It's like, and I, if Murabat al-Hajj has not found it, I'm not going to be able to find it. Um, Imam al-Ghazali at his time, over a thousand years, said the Sheikh al-Kamil, the complete Sheikh, is very rare. Sidi Ahmed Zarruq, when talking about whether or not the Sheikh Kamil, the complete Sheikh, is actually in existence, his Sheikh Ibn Abbad, who has numerous commentaries on the Hikam of Ibn Ata'illah, and Zarruq has about 20 different commentaries on the Hikam, and that's one book that I saw all of my Shiyukh in Mauritania, that the students of Murabat al Hajj read that book all the time, uh, the, the Hikam of Ibn Ata'illah. Um, Ibn Abbad said, there is not a true murid in our times. And this is about six, five, six hundred years ago. He said, there is not a true murid. Al-murid is sadiq. Fama baluka bishaykh. So what do you think about a sheikh? So <clears throat> now I know there's another argument that, okay, we maintain the institution for the barakah of the institution and so on and so forth. I'm just telling you where uh, Murabat al-Hajj. And I'll end with these two stories, three stories, actually. Um, uh, Murabat al-Hajj, it's, it's said that he actually went out and, and visited some Zawiyas to, to uh, explore the possibility of taking on, uh, on, on Tariqah. And he visited two in particular. One of them, he, there was a lot of good things. The people were engaged in dhikr. And then at the end of his stay at that Zawiyah, uh, the Sheikh called him. He said, what do you think about what you've seen? He said, it's great. He said, you're on, you know, you're on the, 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 the Sunnah. You're practicing the Sunnah. Your students are practicing. They're engaged in dhikr. There's a lot going on. But what I fear is not you as the sheikh, is the atba. I fear the people that come after you. Um, in other words, if I take this on, I don't know who's going to take come on after you. And if you look at a lot of tariqahs, even if they start with a very uh, righteous, uh, God-fearing man, you'll see within a few generations, once that tariqah, especially if it's inherited uh, like a monarchy through the children, that by the end, you might get somebody who's not at the level of the founder of that tariqah, and now he's using it for nefarious purposes, for ulterior mot motives and so forth. So he said, I fear the followers. And every time I see a tariqah where a sheikh who's inherited it or uh, taken it, become a muqaddam and does crazy cult-like things, I say, rahmatullahi ala murabat al-hajj. When he was alive, I used to say, hafidhullah, for taking that stance that says, I fear the followers of what might become. The second one was, uh, he went to a mahbara, uh, to a zawiya, and he noticed that there was one student, and he heard about his story, which was that um, that, that student was in, his parents needed him for khidmah. His parents needed his service. You know, that's my son. I need you to help, help me out. But he preferred the khidmah of his sheikh, the companionship and serving his sheikh over uh, his, his, his parents. So Murab al Hajj said, this is against the sunnah. We know the sunnah, the Prophet ﷺ said, serve your parents. Even one man came, he said he wanted to do bay'ah and make hijrah to Medina and fight jihad with the Messenger of Allah وسلم. He says, uh, um, are either of your parents uh, alive? He said, yeah. He said, fafihi ma fajahid. Make your jihad with them and go back. So if the Prophet is saying, no, khidmat, service to your parents, but this sheikh is allowing a student to serve him when not serving his parents, he said, I can't be part of this. Uh, years later in his mahbara, one time a, a, um, a, a student came and they were talking about this mas'ala of how sometimes people will serve their sheikh and neglect their parents. And so um, uh, uh, Murabat al-Hajj turned to one of their students who he knew he was actually from a tariqah family. And he told that student and the rest of the students, he said, if your mother calls you and I call you, answer your mother. Here is, he's, he's affirming the sunnah. So answer your mother, serve your, serve your parents. Um, a lot of uh, tariqahs too, um, or some tariqahs, they really focus a lot on khidmah. That's not, he's like, you know, I, I can go into that uh, second. He said, for the student of knowledge, his wird, when some of the students would ask, I would like to take on a wird. He said, you're a student of knowledge. Your wird is your loh, is your studies. 